All right, everybody. Thanks for stopping by again. Welcome back. And if you're a first time listener to the Strong Life podcast, welcome aboard. Special guest, world's strongest man competitor. I mean, you competed in many different kind of strongman competitions. Welcome, Mark Philippi. Thanks for making the time with the crazy schedule we've been trying to yeah. coordinate. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Good to finally connect. Yes, absolutely. And and as I said before we recorded, you know, I started, of course, I knew about you from TV. I get to see you in World's Strongest Man. I think there was also American or America's Strongest Man. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I had seen you on TV before early days internet. And then early days internet, how I started coming across you was I used to watch The Ultimate Fighter and uh, UFC was doing a lot of uh you know, there was really, I don't even think YouTube was out. So you could only see stuff through like TV shows. So I remember seeing you training Frank Mir yeah. as um, he was the heavyweight champ. Then Brock Lesnar came in then you started training him. And I was like, oh, finally, somebody's like doing real training. Because in the early 2000s, I, what I explained to people, Mark, is functional training was like stand on one leg yeah <laughs> and then yeah. i saw you training him and he's squatting and sprinting the prowler and throwing medicine heavy medicine balls over a squat rack so um you've been at this for quite a while your resume a, a lot of stuff but i don't really know your early um history like um i like to find out who mentored uh, guys like you who got you yeah. into the strength game who was a mentor to you you know I I had a great opportunity because I played you know college football small college football at Montana Tech and after I was done I was like hey I'm gonna lose weight get small you know and all that and then I entered a powerlifting contest and did quite well and and was bouncing around a little bit out west you know working in my field and powerlifting and I moved back to Chicago area and I looked up Ed Cohn and yeah. uh, we ended up hitting it off. I trained with him for two years. We're good friends still. Um, and a lot of what I have done and things I've done, I owe to Ed because, you know, he got me after we trained for a while. He obviously mentored me, um, you know, for a couple of years. I was working in the engineering field, coaching football on the side and powerlifting and I'd come in off midnight shift and half asleep and meet them guys at quads gym. And it was, it was two years. It was great fun. Great. Uh, learned a lot. And then I want to just, you know, get out of engineering, you know, might be the smartest or dumbest thing I ever did. I don't know, depending <laughs> upon the day, you know, you think about that. And uh, I wanted to get into coaching football and I ran out of options. So I started looking at strength and conditioning. What year and was he, that? And he knew that was uh, 1990, 89, 90. I coached, I worked at Inland Steel. I coached at Hobart High School in Indiana. Um, and then he knew Dan Austin down at oh. ULV, and another world champion, you know, power lifter. So yes. I had an opportunity to, you know, move into uh, coaching and strength and conditioning under Dan Austin and another gentleman named Bob Adina who's been, around in the NBA forever in college and back in college now. And uh, so I got a good opportunity to learn strength and conditioning, uh, train on another world champion that actually had an opposite. He trained real fast. Ed was slow, methodical, you know, deliberate. Dan was, man, he, he trained so fast and never, and never sweat. So here I am, I'm a heavier guy trying to keep up after a different type of training and, had the great opportunity to to meet up with Dan, get into strength and conditioning. And then later on, you know, Ed, I called back Ed before I got into strongman. He knew some people over in Great Britain. I had to fly and try out. And he's the one that actually got me into strongman too. So, you know, if there's there's a guy that I I appreciate and love and 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 uh, you know, respect all the above, um, Ed Ed's a good friend of mine. So I'm going to back up a little bit, Mark. So you guys were training like at midnight or 1230? No, I, he would train in the mornings. Yeah. But I would be bouncing between doing engineering projects and working supervision in the in the mill. So I would have to switch shifts. 
So I'd be working all night long and then from work, go right to training in the morning. Cause that's when he trained. Right. You know, right. So like nine o'clock in the morning, I don't, it was around nine. I'd go get some breakfast and fall asleep and wait for training to start. So, you know, sometimes I'd be dozing off in between my sets, but it was what I had to do to, to get in with uh, his training group, you know? Right. And what year roundabout is that? That was eight. I was uh, 89, 90. Yep, yeah, because I got down to UNLV in 91. So, yeah. So was that Ed's, was that during his prime? Those he was just 80s? coming, you know, he was winding it down. You know, he was still hitting some incredible weights, you know, and, and later on he gave me the opportunity to write some programs for him because I was like, because actually when I got down, you know, he, he, he was doing stuff. I'm like, dude, you're going to, he could, he hit, I swear he, there was multiple reps over 900 in the squat and we're spotting him with five guys. And I'm like, what is it? What do we do if he can't do this? I mean, you got five guys, you know, and Ed liked that was weights loose and, you know, certain things, the way he lifted, it would make it a lot harder to spot him. But he was doing some incredible lifts in the gym. That what do you mean his weight's loose? Like he didn't want them squeezed no, together? No, he didn't want them tight. No, he liked to, if you tighten them up, he'd want them to shake so they spin, you know? Oh, yeah. did he like to hear the rumbling? Is that what I think was? he just liked them so they would, you know, I, I, I think he, they, they'll they rotate a little bit, you yeah. know, kind of when they're shaking, they're not so tight. That's they're more, interesting. More forgiving, you know? Yeah, super interesting. Yeah. What, you know, kind of speaking of the training safety and five spotters, what was the, like, what, uh, I think I see there's old training videos of him on YouTube and I can't remember when he squats, if he's in a squat rack or walking no, out of a squat. A, stand. No, no, no squat rack. It was like Jack racks, you know, I, I bought a pair from somebody recently who retired from, uh, he was a football coach slash powerlifter for 41 years. So. Uh, it's a squat stands that have yeah. the car jack. Is that what he was on? Yeah, yeah, that type of thing. Yeah, <laughs> that stuff yeah. is great. It's so scary. There... Yeah, when you got guys that can squat some weight, where it's right. You know. Um, what was your concern with like safety uh, or writing programs for him? Was it because of the v- volume of work he kind of did yeah. some more reps than I think what a normal powerlifter might normally right. do? I think you know, there's certain. I found even in, you know, training of different athletes, they always got to hit set points in their mind and know that they're in, in condition. Right. Gotcha. And sometimes I think it's wasted and needless after a certain point in time, it's counterproductive because in ment- it's, it's productive for your mental psyche, but you got to get over that psyche to kind of allow your body not to be trashed in your training. You know, you just got to know, hey, I'm where I need to be. I don't need to hit five reps at this weight. I do one or two. I'm okay. And sometimes I think, you know, he, you know, he was just used to doing it that way. Can you could do it that way? But right. as you get older, you just obviously don't bounce back as fast. And oh yeah, for longevity or career, sometimes it's better to, you know, cut back on a few of those things. I I always now I'm 47, so I'm. Uh... I feel better now than I did when I was in my mid to late thirties. Um, but I'm also so much smarter with the yeah. programming. And like you said, you know, do you have to do that extra two reps? Like I, um, uh, you know, I feel like I, I uh, deadlifted uh, 495 a couple of weeks ago and I see you deadlifting quite a lot, but I, I know that if I deadlift really hard, I feel like I won't do it again for six months, but it's yeah. there if I need it. It reminds me of a uh, member Arnold Schwarzenegger when they're like the wolf on the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. not so hungry. He's like, yeah, but the food is there. If, if he wants it, he knows right. it's there. Right. Right. So yeah. then, yeah. you know, you go to Dan Austin. Um, also like, I'm not sure the Dan is also like five, five, same like Ed, but not Ed five, was at four. Yeah. Five, four. Five four one sixty five 165, pull 700. And uh, my buddy Jim Steele used to tell me that when Dan would deadlift, it was like he wouldn't let the plates touch the ground. He'd kind of almost touch and mm. come up real fast. So what were some of the things you learned from Dan being that he was a power lifter, but also a strength coach, Yeah, uh, which is early days because, uh, you know, being a, a kid in that, <clears throat> uh, I was in high school, 89 through 93. 
I never heard the word strength coach. I only heard personal trainer. Yeah. It was a new career. I mean, not a new career, but still very unknown. How did you, what were you learning from him and how did that all work? Danny was more, you know, obviously he put a little bit more of the strength and conditioning into this training. He trained fast and it was like, he could recover fast, smaller guy, you know, could bounce back. And whereas Ed, Ed, everything with Ed was perfect. You know, Ed, Ed wouldn't miss. He says he never missed a rep, but you know, we can discuss, we can argue about that. If, if he did, it was my lift off or something, you know, I screwed it up, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but Ed was all about Ed's would don't waste the lift. Everything was like a max mentally dial in. Everything was perfect. And that's, you know, that's a lot of what I learned from Ed. Don't waste reps. Right. And gotcha. Dan was fast. Not that Dan wasted reps, but Ed was more methodical, slow. He was bigger. Um, and you know, just a deliberate style of lifting where Dan could recover and get through his stuff a lot faster. And I think I blended the two together kind of, I, you know, I wasn't, I didn't like the lift rule. So not that I didn't like it. I just, sometimes, as you know, as a strength coach, you got limited time. So yes. you kind of blended the two together where I could allow myself to recover a little bit faster, add a little more volume, try and help the conditioning part of it a little bit, you know, and I think that helped me when I went into strongman. So, right. So in powerlifting, what was Dan doing? Was he doing like a, a power lift followed by jumps? What was the conditioning or just less rest? We would do powerlifting workouts, but then we would add some other conditioning type workouts to it. And you could never keep up to them. I mean, it was, what was the workouts? Because in the early nineties, I mean, uh, now knowing my research, you know, Dr. Ken Leisner in the eighties was doing like the odd objects and the strongman, but yeah. Otherwise I don't really know of anybody else doing that stuff. You know, it was year. more fast paced, some circuit type stuff. I remember Dan just doing some incredible dumbbell jumps onto a box, heavy freaking dumbbells. You know what I'm saying? Just, he was free. He was strong, man. It was incredible how strong he was, and you know, and just at a fast pace to where, and he never sweat. I don't know. I'm dying in some Vegas. It's hot, you know. Oh, yeah. Bouncing back and recovering, you know. Yeah. Right. Also, you were coming from, uh, you were in Chicago and Montana yeah. before that. Yeah. <laughs> Must yeah, have been a like a while. real yeah. Heat, yeah. heat wave shock. Um, so those early 90s, you know, I'm look, I'm thinking, I'm looking at my bookshelf, the strength and conditioning books that were out back then i mean even secrets of soviet sports and fitness training was not i think that was written no. in 94 or something yeah. what yeah. what were you guys back going then it to? was still kind of like you know deadlift had a bad name you know yes. now it actually made a bar you know now you got hex bars and all that's dead right resurgent but it was like if you were you know you got into the you had to be doing olympics olympic movements and all that stuff it was kind of that genre um and if you were a power lifter, you're going to be slow. And if you're an Olympic lifter, you're fast and blah, blah, blah. It was always one extreme or the other instead right. of kind of blending the two together, you know. But did you I guys blend remember, hey, don't deadlift, you're going to hurt your back. And, you know, it's it's just, still like that today. You know, <laughs> people it, crying. Yeah. You know, I always I say, you know, if you did a great bicep workout and your arms, you couldn't lift them the next day. Somebody would say that was a great arm workout. But <laughs> That's right. You did a, you know, RDLs or, or deadlift and your back was a little sore. They say, oh, you messed my back up. You know, I that, know that, I, I've experienced, they yeah. always say, I threw out my back. Oh, your yeah. back is a little bit sore. Well, we'll do some sleds, some hanging yeah. abs, you know, we'll do some lunges and uh, you'll be, but yeah, they, it's yeah. interesting. Back soreness translation to like an, a non-lifter is I threw out my back and yeah, they, they act like the world yeah. is ending. <laughs> I don't know. I just tell everybody if you got a problem, if you're sick, go deadlift. If you, I just say go deadlift because if you're deadlift strong, you're probably pretty strong. You feel pretty good. So it's like a man it's, lift. It's a right? vaccine. Just go do you do some deadlifts, you'll feel better. That is great. And what's interesting about the deadlift too is like we're in this you know era of uh, like people trying so many different deadlifts. But when I look at your Instagram, you're just doing a basic deadlift. You're not on a block you're not with chains or bands it's just a deadlift yeah there's uh you can get me started on deadlift with straps and deadlift bars and 
in sumo, which isn't really a deadlift. Um, we, <laughs> uh, <laughs> people will be pissed about that one, but that's um, okay. Let's get yeah, into it. But it's, but it's, um, yeah, when I trained with Ed, not that, I mean, I think there's a lot of good ideas out there. I really do. But we didn't use a band. We didn't use a chain. Right. We didn't use anything special other than good, good, good numbers, you know, picked each week and, and solid technique. And I think that still has to be, you know, the, the smart thing to do first before you get too tricky with things. You got to have the basics down. And if you don't, then the other stuff, you're just building off of a poor foundation, you know. Um it's interesting because I think Ed switched to sumo later on, right? Was he injured or, or something? Well, or? you know, when I was, we just had this conversation when he was in for the Olympia, because I was talking, you know, kidding around about the sumo. He goes, you forgot I could pull 870 conventional too. And I said, yeah, you're right. I did forget that he could do both. Right. He would do both. And I, honestly, I don't know. I think maybe he was a little bit more comfortable. Maybe it was easier on him doing the sumo, but he didn't have a wide sumo stance anyway. He had that like frog type, yeah, exactly. uh, which is like yeah. a, a squat. He squatted yeah. the weight up. Yep, yeah, exactly. And uh, but he could do both. He was, you know, he, he wasn't weak at anything, pretty much. You know what I'm saying? I know. I beat him in a pinch grip contest once, and I'll never let him forget it. But oh, uh, he has those about that too. He yeah. has those big hands. Now, Mark, how tall are you? Because Ed, you said is like five five. Yeah, five six. six. I think he's a little taller than that. Yep. Yeah. How tall are you? I used to be six foot. I'm not anymore. So somewhere between five eleven and a half, and probably right around five eleven. And yeah, a half. I think I've five also dropped. Impressed. Yeah, I've dropped maybe half an inch. So here's the other thing that just came to my mind when you were in Chicago, <clears throat> were you contemplating strength and conditioning because Al Vermeil was training the Chicago yeah. Bulls and he was big. I love. I, I did a podcast with him a year ago. And he's very much about basics, yep. work, squat, deadlift, yep. clean and press. Did you ever connect with him when you were there? I, you know, I didn't. I wish I would have. I mean, right. he's, he's, you know, legend, good, good, you yeah, know, a, a world of knowledge. And I didn't because I actually, uh, honestly, when I was getting into strength, when I got into strength and conditioning, I wanted to coach offensive line somewhere and get a college job. But as you know, it's a, it's a, as you know, who, you know, business, you got to know people, get your foot in the door. And I ran out of kind of options in, on that end. And somebody suggested, well, Trump, why don't you get into strength and conditioning? You can always try and switch over then, you know, and then I, so I did, I got into strength and conditioning and, you know, not to get ahead of it, but, you know, Bob, my immediate, you know, the, the assistant went to the NBA and Dan two years later was gone. So I moved up real fast and, was the interim in two years and took the program over within, I was a little bit older cause I was in the working world for a while. So, you know, there was advantages, but I got, I was a head strength coach faster than it's supposed to happen. You know, maybe, just, uh, maybe that wasn't a good thing, you know, but it was, you know, it was but, just but football it Mark. Uh, no, just I ran the whole program at UNLV, like every sport. Yeah. It's so interesting. Like Joe Ken tells me like his early days of coaching he was coaching like groups of like 50 and his baby was on the, the back, the front back. <laughs> and he's like, you know, coaches today have a lot of assistants. Uh, yeah. The rooms of course are bigger, but like, I think football could have five strength coaches or one head, five assistants. And uh, you know, they might be coaching three squat racks and Joe Ken talks about like, you know, a dozen squat yeah. racks managing them. So what was your man? I, I always say that college strength and conditioning is is not good on your health. What was your schedule if you were training all the teams? You know, when we first started off, our facility was terrible. You know, it was like split two rooms. You know, it was limited, and I wouldn't say there was fifteen at teams that time. It increased like seventeen. I, my numbers may be off a little bit, but not all of them were hitting it real. You know, back then some. Some buy in, some didn't, some, you know, whatever it was. So it was mostly, um, it was mostly football, basketball, you know, baseball was in every morning. So the main Olympic sports you think of, but then it, it grew as we, you know, we improved our facilities and whatnot. You know, swimming was a big one, you know, in different groups. And uh, when we improved our facility, I had to blend, you know, we had to be able by Title IX lift 
swimming in the same time football was in there, which doesn't hurt. Oh. It wasn't heard of right now, but <laughs> that's right. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was tricky to schedule that. And yet, you know, I remember having to sit in front of a committee to tell them I was going to schedule the weight room, you know? Um, so, you know, you, you, I think it's, it's a, uh, you learn how to sit back and see dysfunctional movement to pick it out. You know what I'm saying? Everything looks good. Oh, that didn't look good over there. You go fix that guy type of thing. You're able to, once you learn to do it, kind of scan more, um, racks than the average person. That's a personal trainer. That's used to training one or two people. You just kind of look for type things. And as you know, yeah, you can pick it up easier. It's kind of a learned skill. I think over time, what, what were, um, athletes doing to track training? Were you printing out a bunch of Excel uh, cards? Yeah, exactly. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Excel that must have been so. madness. A hundred Excel cards everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. We were, you know, I usually do usually do them by the week and just cut paste print, you know, the max is yeah. at the top with the formulas in and, you know, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because now everything is so software based but I, I wonder, like, there's some great coaches with the software, but then there's some great software people who don't really have the coaching ability, like you said, to look from across the room and be like, all right, that squat's a little bit high, or I'm seeing you from across the room, your hips are high and your knees are bucking in, Now you're going to walk over there and yeah. say, listen, cut it down 15% and just do three reps instead of five. Let's get a clean set. That, to me, I always say is the art of coaching that sounds like you're describing yeah you gotta you gotta start from a position of success and build off of whatever that is you know if it's you know reducing the range of motion to start with or whatever if you got a kid or whatnot that's not capable of hey get lower but he doesn't know what lower means you know that type of thing so you just learn to change it and fix it and then build off that you know so um i i'm you know, I've used some of them applications and I, when I write workouts, I got to lay them out and see them on a big, you know, where, how they roll out. It's very difficult for me just to sit down and type a workout in. I, it's almost like I got to write it, type it, and then revise it. And, and, you know, I, I admire the people that can just sit down and whip one out and put it in uh-huh. and the app spits the workout. That's funny. Um, I can't do that. My buddy, Joe DeFranco, when he does his privates, he still like writes them on a, uh, in a yeah. notebook. Yep. And I think it's like has some sort of a like the way an artist when they're writing or drawing, there might uh, some sort of like a neuro connection. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I was thinking of that today. I was like, before I put the program at the high school, I'm going to write it down. I, I love using like the uh, old uh, yellow notepads. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it is like something about it. It's like just I have a connection to it. Um, it's easy for me. I mean, if you look at even the workouts, I do them on Excel now, you know, still Excel. <laughs> four weeks at a time where there's blocks of them. But, yeah, you know, as I'm doing them, they're scribbled all over the place because I'm That's changing cool. stuff on the fly. And, you know, you can't predict what somebody can do at one time four yes. weeks before that, you know, or something happened, an injury. So I tell people, look at my workouts and they're they're all different than when I first started for whatever. It's not all, but a lot of them are, you know, yeah. Change it as I go along if, if something doesn't look right. So, yeah, it's like uh, you, we get really locked in. And I think that's the flaw to some training programs. And uh, I look at it kind of like two sided. Like sometimes the athlete may not feel like it. So they have to overreach to give them the confidence to be able to do it in competition. But like you said, you don't want to waste reps or waste it in training. If it doesn't need to be, uh, yeah. buddy, buddy Morris told me like way back in the day, I called him on the phone. It was probably around Oh four. And he said, what you're saying about the paper. He said, I'll put something up on a whiteboard. And once I see them moving, I'm erasing and scribbling and changing. And, uh, just that conversation was so impactful for me, even though it was 20 years ago, mm-hmm. I still, it gave me this like, uh, uh you know, permission to change and not to be so rigid. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just grateful that I had that one phone call with him back then. And I was texting him the other day. <clears throat> there was like a video of uh, that the Arizona Cardinals did. So he was talking just like what you said, Mark, the four week training block. He said, we change things so often that there's no, so he looked at like, you know, an introductory week, 
a uh, intensification technique, a realization or actualization technique. He's like, then week four could be a deload, but he called it stabilize. He's like, how about we just like hold and like Let versus sit in? Yeah. Yeah. Like versus, in, yeah. I got to go to the next thing. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I've been coaching not as long as you, but since like mid nineties and I found myself switching things too soon. Yeah. And yeah. so I just programmed normally, like if we're squatting, I like to switch the squat every three weeks, maybe two weeks. I was like, we're going to box squat again because our box squats look like shit. And so we haven't had any realization, let alone stabilization. So we might do it more often. Yeah. So I want to like uh, move forward a little bit. Uh, so in the 90s, you're coaching at UNLV. And then I know you were competing. Strongman started coming out around the mid 90s, right? Believe yeah. It. Yeah, I was out on TV and. I switched because I was in AADFPA and I ended up winning. Oh, American nationals. Drug Free Powerlifting yeah, Association? Yeah. And yeah. then it switched over to USAPL the next year, right? Um, 96. Okay. And I, you know, somehow pulled out of my ass. I beat Brad Gillingham on my last deadlift. I met Brad. Wow. And Brad... <laughs> obviously it became a pretty damn good power lifter right and i'm like well yeah. see the difference was they had a 319 pound weight class and brad was lifting at about 315 and i was lifting at about 280 something you know and i was like either i gotta go up or i gotta go down you know and then i started watching tv and i'm like you know what i'm gonna see how i can you know i, I stack up against them guys on tv and, and strongman so when i ended up winning nationals and um, I decided, hey, I'm going to, you know, I called that up. I said, you know, anybody in Strongman? He goes, yeah, I know Jamie Reeves and Doug Edmonds. And I said, all right. And I just, he made a phone call for me and I had to fly over in 97 to World Muscle Power Championships in Scotland, which is a two day heavy, heavy show. They kind of separate the men from the boys. And I think it's on YouTube. Two. And uh, I finished second behind Raymond's Bergmanis. And I, um, I think it's on YouTube, Mark, that competition. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I look back now and if I had, we had social media when I was on ESPN, I'd be doing pretty good right now. Oh my! I didn't God. get anything out of it, you know? So anyway, what was that competition again, Mark? It was called, it was called world muscle power championships in calendar, Scotland. It was an annual thing and two days, eight events, in a field and they had world highland game championships along with it. So you had like Ryan Vieira and guys like that coming over to compete big time highland games, all the guys, you know, um, gold, Rick, all, you know, it was just, it was, it was pretty cool. I never been out of the country before. And, and the, the funny thing was a month before they go, we need somebody, we need an American in Lithuania. And I'm like, I don't even know where the hell Lithuania is, but I'll go, you know? So I, I fly to Heathrow and I meet up with Magnus Ver Magnuson, have lunch with him, never met him before, hook up with Jamie Reeves. They were traveling buddies every weekend in Europe. They were somewhere, you know, and I go to Lithuania and compete in Lithuania. And it was when it was, uh, I mean, I, I, I had a guy, I could write a book about these trips I took, you know, it was, but long story short, like, um, Manford Herbal, Wayne Price, you know, was Savickas's first contest I competed with. Wayne Manfred like, yeah. had the, the massive arms, yeah, right? Yeah, massive arms, you know, everybody. So it's like you see these guys on TV and then you're competing next to them in your first contest, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I got my ass kicked. I didn't even know the events. These guys are like, what they were these every weekend. And, you know, and, and, you know, I, you land, you know, these guys were three hours to the, three hours to the competition the night before and Jamie's buying whiskey, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, I don't even know what the events are. I'm, I'm nervous as hell, you know, what so, were, what were some of the events? Because I'm trying they had to remember pole push. They had a, they had a yoke that was a log with chain and anchors on it. And if you didn't <laughs> know how to walk with it, it shook you, oh, yeah. you know, so 
you know, I, I walked like down and you had to turn around and come back. And most of the people didn't finish. So I'm thinking I walked more than most guys didn't. And I dropped it and I'm thinking, oh yeah. And then Bronius, the guy that ran the competition goes, no finish, no points. I'm like, well, if I'd have known that, I'd have dropped it right away. Cause I knew I wasn't going to finish, you know? Oh. So the, the rules were changing as you went along, you know, yeah. it was like, and I went to, I've competed in Lithuania three times and it, you could write a book about every one of them. I mean, it was just hilarious and, and the way the things went and, and it was, it was an eye opener and all those. So then I went to stayed with Jamie for a week and uh, went up to uh, Scotland What actually his brother Jock, who I became friends with because I ran a contest down here and flew Jock over to be the referee. He was refing up there. And Jamie went off with Magnus somewhere in Europe to compete. And uh, and I took second. And it was, you know, some decent competitors, some U.S. guys, uh, Bergmanis, Wayne Price was there, Ver, Vet, Reg and Vagadol, you know, guys that were on TV the year before and happened to beat them. And then that kind of, you know, put me into where they figured I could hang, you know, and then I got more invites after that. So it's interesting. So you're doing this in the mid nineties and I'm thinking world's strongest man started in the late seventies and it was like bodybuilders and some retired NFL guys. And it's interesting that it took decades to enter strength and conditioning. So um, when you were at UNLV in the beginning, were you, uh implementing uh any strongman stuff right when i started doing strongman i did i i kind of laugh as like i was probably the first one to flip a tire yep you know in training yeah. to say hey this stuff's going to be pretty good because i got you know um um the guy started making the equipment after a few years you know simulating the events but early on i just got a tire got a pole push it's weird. You know, I got took so different, long. different implements yes. that we started using keg toss, you know, mm -hmm. keg clean and press type things for instability. That must have been um, great for the you guys. Know, diff different stuff like that. So as soon as I started training for it, I had, I didn't know how to train. You know, I was watching a video of the year before's contest, trying to figure out, well, how I needed to train, you know, and then I just started training. And what it did was, Powerlifting, you know, you always go back to roots. I love powerlifting, but it diversified my training and made it a lot more interesting, you know, to where you got to learn to mix the weights and the, the uh, events together and how do you do that. And, you know, nobody really had it down, you know, so you kind of had to experiment on how to do things like that. Yeah, I had to get a truck to pull a truck, you know, oh, yeah. all that type of stuff. And, um, you know, it was kind of, it made it, it made it fun. It made you, you know, change things up and you could apply it to your athletes, you know? Oh yeah. Well, well you know, I have a old, old video of Dr. Ken at Virginia tech helping Mike Gentry <clears throat> and they were um, flipping a tire, but not a heavy tire. They're pushing like an old station wagon. Yeah. You know, he be, he really implemented what he saw from early days, world's strongest man. And um, a friend of mine used to coach and also played football at Virginia tech, uh, but not back then. But he said they did. It was called the Iron Man Challenge because they mm -hmm. called Mike Gentry Iron Mike. Yeah. He yeah. said, so even if you win, you get an anvil. And he said, so you are you have to, he goes, even when you win, it requires more work because now you have to carry the anvil. Yeah. It's like a hundred plus pound anvil. I thought that was really cool. And it's interesting now, we don't see too many uh, college strength coaches doing strongman because now the big thing is like velocity yeah, speed, speed yeah. and uh i get it like sports have evolved a little bit like football became more of a game of speed wrestling is this like funk type sport where they don't let go of moves and uh, flexibility and mobility are, are more important so yeah it's Interesting. What were like, were there any lessons that the guys taught you when you went to Scotland on training that you really were like, Oh, this is very, <laughs> I'm going to use this. No, not really. It was like, you know, I'm sitting in a tent it's raining out. I'm like, Hey, where do we warm up? And they laughed at me. <clears> and it was like a bar and two 45 pound weights sitting on the ground. And it wasn't even put on there. It was like, not that they didn't know training, but you know, you just learn to, 
you had to figure a way to warm up when you didn't have a lot of stuff. You know That's, what I'm saying? It was what, like, what did you do to warm up? You had to, you know, you go grab this, try and grab the stone in between. They're setting them up to pick a light one up a couple right. of times, or, <laughs> you know, you just grab something that's yeah. could warm you up because they're, you know, you pick the, the, the farmer walk tube implement up a couple of times, take a few steps with it. And, and that was it. You know, I mean, I, when I went to Lithuania in consecutive times, I went and watched some Olympic lifting going on, or I met with, you know, we, you know, we did a lot of stuff, brought boxing coaches over there. And, you know, when Jamie was going over there with me and it was quite interesting, I learned a lot from people asking them how they trained, you know, Bergmanis pop off a, a ex Bulgarian lifter I competed against. And so you would try and pick guys brains, but some of the times you there, it was pretty remedial on what you had a chance to warm up with. And it was, you know, just go lift it, you know, and, you know, that's the way it was. It was, there was no, you know, you can, you could bitch and complain all you wanted. It didn't matter. It's like, Hey, you want to, you want to compete? Let's go compete. You know, and that's kind of the, the mentality. You Very raw. To. Yeah. 100%. What, what, right. Who was Jamie? You know, you mentioned he brought Jamie like Reeves. He won world's strongest man in 89. 89. Yeah. I'll have to look it up on yeah. um, YouTube. But when you mentioned that, uh, what was the again the name of that first strongman contest you did? Um, it was in Lithuania. What was that called? Uh, I don't what? know what it was called. It was they had it. I was in it three years because we went back and it was in Klepeda, uh, no Vilnius. No, no, no. Sorry, Klepeda. I used to fly into the main town. It was like a. It was on the Baltic. Yeah, right uh -huh. on the Baltic, and it was. Um, it was interesting. Yeah. I'll see what uh, videos I could pull up on YouTube. A yeah. couple of years ago, I remember um, up in Lake George, like putting my son to bed and we were watching like old world strongest man, but not, they weren't world strongest man. They were some of the thing like uh, you mentioned the name of, they had different strongman challenges yeah. Oh yeah. and it was, it was cool seeing a lot of them with like uh, John Paul Sigmerson. Yep. Yeah. Did you yeah, ever Jock Reeves was good friends with John Paul Sigmerson. Yeah. Jamie's brother. Yes. So they knew each other well. And he told me, John Paul, when he wanted to gain weight, he said, we sat and it was like dingy, you know, it's Sheffield, England. That's where I stayed. Jamie was from Sheffield, right. industrial town. And he said, we, John Paul ate a half uh, ice cream bar every half hour for eight hours for two weeks. <laughs> some, <laughs> some boy to gain weight, you know, it just sounded wacky. And, and I don't have, may have not have it down perfect, but it was something right. like that. I just started laughing. I, uh, <laughs> just that ice cream, you know, <laughs> yeah. Some kids today, so skinny, they could, you know, they really need to eat anything. Um, I remember in my early years of bodybuilding, I trained at a place called diamond gym, and there was a kid there that um, I think he won like the middleweight nationals turned pro. And uh, they said like um, when he would sleep, he would set the alarm every two hours at night to have a protein shake yeah. to just like eat on the clock every two hours. So in the eight hours, it was like three protein shakes before his breakfast, wake up, you know, whatever that. And I was like, man, amazing how some guys have to just keep eating so much more. Um, so when did you, um, leave UNLV and then open your own, uh, Philippi sports Institute? When was that? Oh, six. Yeah. I was there 15 years. And then, you know, I worked under John Robinson, you know, my last, well, one year with Mike Sanford, but for that, and I learned a lot from, he was incredible, um, mind, not just in football, but the, we always wanted to know about the athletic mind, you know, you, you know, the guy treated me great. And I loved talking to him because motivationally, he did some things when he would talk to the team that you could just sit back. And when I first entered the first meeting, you know, you, as a, you know, as a strength coach, you change head coaches, you're not sure you got a job or not. That's right? right. Yeah. So I wasn't sure I had a job. I just started, kept coaching my guys and, and, you know, it worked out because he, you know, he, he watched me coach, I guess, and, and, and liked it, but I, I would sit in a meeting and watch the guy talk to the team and how he did it in different techniques. And it was, it was amazing. It was incredible. You know, I'm what sitting there was... thinking to myself, you know, these guys don't really know this guy who's towards the end of his career. He's like a Lou Holtz. He could probably get 25 grand a speech. I mean, now 50, it might be a lot more than that. And you guys are going to get this every day, every what, single day. What was his name again? John Robinson. He was, uh, he was the ex 
U, USC head coach, and then he was with the Rams, and he went back to USC. And but they, I think, won a national championship his first time at USC. And he, um, you know, the guy was was the era of Lou Holtz and that, you know, like yeah. You know, but what did he say to the kids that really just, uh, inspired just, you? He would tell, you know, he would make stuff up. You know, it'd be like, you know, I remember we were down at, I don't know where we were playing, but, you know, we we're getting beat at first. He'd go, and he'd be like, 87.6% of the time this happens. And the kid's like, oh, really? Oh, you know, he would just make, but he would learn, you know, different techniques to motivate yeah. people and how he did it, you know. And when, you know, when he called the team up, you know, and the coaches, everybody screaming, quiet, you know, listen, he wouldn't talk very loud. He talked like we're talking. And then everybody had to lean in to listen to what I he had to, to say. I need to do that more. You know what I'm saying? Because he would just, you know, it was just, there was different stuff you picked up on. And he did not care. Um, he couldn't count the weights on the bar. You know what I'm saying? So what they lifted was irrelevant. It was, can you make, can you have my guy, do this, you know, can he, can he do this movement on the field? How do we get this guy doing this movement on the field? It was my job to figure out how to do that in the weight room. He wasn't hung up on this guy benches this, this guy does that, this guy, you know, the numbers weren't his thing, you movement know, where I could say, Hey, look at this many tons of this guy. He's like, mm, that's nice. Can he, can he rush the passer? You know what I'm saying? That type of thing. So yeah, he was more all about that, you know, and, and I had a player, that played in the NFL, Ryan Claridge, one of my best guys. He could have done strong, man. He was, um, you know, the kid's brother, Travis, played in the NFL. And and I remember he was training. If I was at the gym and I was training, you know, sometimes I was there on Sunday training, he'd be training, you know. He was there whenever I was there. And and, and we were spring ball, and Ryan was a linebacker and played on the tennis team the first two years at 230 wow. pounds. You know, I mean, could change directions, obviously, right? Holy. So – it was spring and I was training for something. And Ryan was off season. He walks in and Ryan's about two sixty something right now. And, and John Robinson looked at him and shook his head. He's ah, uh-uh. you know, he's got to get lighter. You know, it was just, it was, he, he just, he let you do your job. He didn't care. He just wanted the end result. And that was refreshing. You know, where you're yeah. not getting micromanaged <clears throat> on how you do things. Just put, I, yeah. you know, put it out there, you know, and he, and he, you know, if, he wasn't a big disciplinarian. So it was my job to do that. But he said, I don't care what you do. Just don't paint me in a corner. Don't tell my starting quarterback. He's not starting or whatever, but whatever you got to do, you know, just go ahead and do it. And it was, it was, it was, it was a good, good gig. at the time. Yeah. I like that when you can work with the sport coach and they're into the movement and like you're, you legitimately feel like you're on a coaching team. Right. Um, and you know, listen, even at the high school level, Mark, I'll talk to strength coaches and they'd be like, Hey, this assistant comes in and he's just like, you know, he's not really helping or he's telling kids to do something that we don't really do. And, you know, I don't, that's always like, does the strength coach go on the football field or on the tennis court or out on the track and tell the kids how to run or we don't. So it's so great when you have somebody who is like flowing with you. I I used to also, uh, when I was at Lehigh and Rutgers, I would uh, always like go into the office of the wrestling coaches and we would just discuss wrestling and training and movement. And that's, that's, I love that stuff. It's not that common, unfortunately. No, no, no. Maybe because their coaches are so busy doing a hundred things today. Yeah. Yeah. I like the uh, tactic of the coach, like not being loud and making you lean in. Somebody told me something like that a very long time ago about a coach doing that. And they said the kids would have to lean in and listen. Yeah. <clears throat> um, he had more of a pro mentality because he had been in the NFL and then oh, back yeah. in college. And right. so it was kind of like, you know, when he, he treated them like men, but if they couldn't handle that then he would treat him like kids you know what i'm saying so it was like yeah he, and, he, and he had a saying i'm not going to treat you all the same but i'm going to treat you fairly mm-hmm. you know? so like it's like if you're if you're a starting quarterback versus a walk-on type thing not your not that i'm talking about you you treat somebody badly i'm just saying you know you might get cut a break or that guy's trying to make the team type thing you know what i'm saying so it was never 
you know, were you treating anybody improperly? It was more, you know, you had to earn your way on the team versus a guy that was, you know, your starting quarterback versus, you know, whatever. Such a powerful yeah. lesson for uh, people to understand of like, you will earn your way to this um, because it's like, even at the college level, some kids think, oh, I did so-and-so and I should be, yeah. I should be the starter at this spot or this weight class. Um, we we have like five more minutes or so left and I'm going to like fast forward to something. Um, you know, I mentioned you earlier, you don't really post a lot of stuff on Instagram. So it was interesting. The first time I saw you training the Azerbaijan wrestling team mm -hmm. in their country. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking to myself, well, Mark is near Colorado. Why didn't our own country get a hold of him? And so another country sees you and they utilize you. And uh, I thought that was real interesting. So how did like those coaches or wrestlers find out about you? You know, I, uh, Eric Serrano, you know, Eric Serrano, Dr. Doctor? Serrano. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm friends with Eric from yes. you know, way back and, and they were doing some blood testing. There was a consultant that was working with the wrestling team that found him and was working with him. And then they talked about doing some strength and conditioning, needed some strength and conditioning work. And he got a hold of me and it was 2015. The world championships were in town here in Vegas. That's right. And then yes. he came in to test them all while they were here. And then they had me over and kind of interviewed with the head of the Federation, talked to him. And it was like Labor Day or something. And honestly, I didn't think it went, went very well. I said, basically, if you were going to ask me about wrestlers, I said, they're not very strong. And, and there's reasons why you need to be strong. I said, I haven't done a lot of wrestling. I've done more MMA guys, things right. like that, fighters. But the stronger you are, the less energy you got to expend, you know, you can be quicker, blah, blah. I told them the reasons why you wanted to be stronger. And I found like they do too much cardiovascular yes. crossfit ish type 70% Correct. and it, it bleeds their strength away. So anyway, I just left that meeting. I was, I said, well, that didn't go very well. And then uh, two weeks later, it called me up and asked me to come over to Baku. And I went over there for like week, 10 days and they wanted me to watch and then train their team a little bit. And then you know, they said, can you come back in January? And I said, all right. So I went back for two weeks and then they brought me back in February. And then in March, they had a guy from Germany doing their strength coaching already for since London. I don't know. Hmm. And they wanted to make some changes and wrestling had changed a little bit from three periods to two. And, and um, they said, well, job's yours. If you and it want. was the Greco or the freestyle team both, or both? Both. What well, started <clears throat> mostly with freestyle. And then I took the Greco over also and have done a blend of both over the time and then i was there six eight weeks at a time i had some guys running my gym here and then was at the rio olympics three weeks before we moved up into rio um it was it was mixed bad rio we won five medals out of six weight classes in freestyle actually more than any other country i you know the problem was we ran into kyle snyder and he beat my net my guy guzman off two one in the final and I had another guy lose to a Russian and um, you know, it was, it was a great experience. And then they brought me back in 2019 for the world championships. Uh, they brought me back for like 12 weeks before Tokyo, you know, we're, we're, we're talking now. I don't know. We'll see if something happens again. It just, it kind of, they go through a lot of political changes. It's, it's, yes. you gotta know, you know, the lay of the land and whatnot. So I kind of fell into it through another guy that I, you know, we can get on about people. I, that really have helped me in my career. Eric Serrano is another one of them guys. Yeah, I know Doc. He's he's helped, he's me, helped yeah. me a lot too. Yeah. Um. So it's interesting. They were interviewing other coaches yeah. at the Worlds. I what, what did they yeah. do? Bring you into a office to interview? No, I was just... up in the Wynn Casino in this guy's hotel room, and it was him. Eric was up there with some doctors. The head was of it an American? What, was a American guy interviewing you or no? A translator? No, it was a translator. She. It was a woman that was there doing consulting. She was from Azerbaijan, but she was a, she could speak English. And then right. uh, the head of the Federation's son, Abdul, was London educated. So he was, nice. he was yeah, smart guy. And, and uh, why, um, so. Mark, why do you think the interview didn't go good? Because you were kind of placing a premium on being strong? No, because I was just kind of like, whatever. I, it was just the way it kind of went down. You know, I was blunt and, um, 
you know, they it's hard to get a read on people when you don't know them from a different country and whatnot. Yes. It's kind of like, all right, you want to ask me anything else? I got to go. I'm, I'm flying out tonight. So it was kind of a short thing and, you know, it was, you know, but it ended up, you know, going all right. And now, you know, it's, it's been great experience. Yeah. Really good experience. Yep. And amazing. Over there, we've, you know, when I was over there for the preparation for the Olympics, we were flying in. The U.S. Greco team came in for a while. I was actually coming back to the U.S. for that one. But we, I, you know, I trained the Cuban uh, national team, you know, four time Greco Roman champion. Yes. And Lopez from you know, unbelievable athlete. You know, I mean, we had other guys from, I didn't, even, you don't get a, you know, I wasn't into international wrestling. And then all of a sudden, you see these guys in training camp and all of a sudden they're standing on the podium at the Olympics and they're from other countries. You go, wow, I guess that guy was pretty good. You know, (laughs) Um, with the Cubans, you know, there's that famous or infamous photo of their weight room, which is just like a bench and like a pull-up bar. It looks like a prison yard. So I guess you had to, did they know how to like train with weights or no? You know, some of them did more than others, you know, they don't have the the funds and whatever. We were actually going to go to Brazil and train and it fell through. So we brought the Cuban team over for three weeks, but I, you know, the athletes over where like, to Azerbaijan, to Azerbaijan. Or yeah. Oh, okay. Up in, you know, we were, uh, you know, kind of close to Georgia up in the mountains and the, the training facilities I was in their Olympic training centers, pretty, high school like training accommodations you know what i'm saying so they're yeah. getting by up there with not high tech stuff too which is fine with me because i think it holds that mentality to yes you know it's a different type of mentality but you also get you know everything's club based there and when you're over here you go to university so you're forced to go through a strength and conditioning program and you're used to it and over there you know it's club based and some guys do it some guys don't so their philosophy on bringing me over was, you know, them, obviously the Russians, Dagestan's not far away from there. You know, it's just a little bit, you know, a few hours to the north. But they wanted to combine their superior technical skill because they all grow up doing international wrestling yes. with U.S. strength and conditioning, figuring if you combine both of them, you would, you would have a winning ticket. You know, he said the U.S. guys win on conditioning. They're, they're, they condition I've and, heard that. Yeah. and some of them obviously are very technical too. I'm not taking that away from right, them. Right. But in general terms, the U S guys are, are conditioned well. Right. And even one guy I remember in Rio is like, man, U S guys never give up. I said, no, they don't. They ain't gonna give up. I don't care how far they are down. Whereas I'm not saying other people do. I'm just saying they notice these things about the U S athletes and the strength and conditioning programs over here. And by their own admission, we got the best strength and conditioning programs in the world. And that's what they wanted to combine the, the aspect of both strength and conditioning with, you know, the, the superior international style of wrestling. Interesting that they, <clears throat> you know, we've learned so much from the early Soviet union. Yeah. Interesting that they didn't, but I guess Russia is their competitor because yeah. now it's the States, right? It's the Dagestan, Georgia. I, there's yeah. like, they compete against but but they still don't you know i i laugh and we're using your stuff you mm-hmm. know what i mean because it used to be the old soviet union azerbaijan was part of the old soviet yes. union and you know we're using your old training methodologies you know Correct. but they've kind of not all but some of them have gotten away from that and you know they have different coaches in different parts of the country that do things different way because it's such a vast country you know right. whereas and even a lot of our wrestlers are from Russia. Some are from Iran. It's kind of like you have a free agency style of, you know, you can go run and you're finding a lot of Russian wrestlers in other parts of Europe now getting passports and stuff, you know, yes. or, so because there's so many of them there, it's this unbelievable amount of wrestlers in Dagestan that, you know, you, you, and the quality is very high. So, you know, we get, you get different wrestlers from different parts of the world and, you know, you just needed a training methodology to pull it kind of all together that little yeah gaining that slight edge it's really it's cool uh you've got some old videos on your instagram i I will uh scroll back and uh 
post them on the blog so people can see them. The guys, I just remember watching them very explosive, athletic. And uh, I think it's because when they're young, like you said, they're introduced to international style. And um, they also climb rope and do gymnastics. Mm -hmm. The wrestling coaches implemented into practice, which I think that's the American mistake is we have high school kids who can't do a pull up, who can't do, you know, a cartwheel to both sides. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we're lagging in that respect. So really cool. So Mark, we're, we'll definitely have to do a part two. Um, you know, so we have a Philippi, what's the website again? Philippi sports Institute, Philippi sports Institute.com. And they yeah. can, uh, reach out yeah. to you on uh, Instagram. That's how yeah. you and I connected. Yeah. And um, how involved are you day to day at your private uh, facility? <laughs> Almost too involved. Yeah. So, I know that uh, feeling. Yeah. You know, I was running the business. So, you know, I, I, I'm putting together some uh, online concierge programming. Um, I have another Instagram site. That's more of my lifting stuff, you know, aside from at Mark Philippi. So we're kind of, I'm building off trying to branch out into the online market a little bit to work, to working with uh, a few people now, um, hands on writing programs, calling them, checking up on them, that type of thing. So I like doing that. Yeah. I've done a few uh, like that as well. It's kind of like a VIP coaching and you're yeah. doing it for um, corporate, like men that are yeah. busy. Um, and I think just with your experience, you must know exactly how to give them, you know, stuff you were saying, like, give them just enough that produces results and no less and no more. Yep. Like it's just dialed in. Yep. We, yeah. I have some uh, adult clientele that's on some pretty high level program. That's been with me for a while that nice. you know, they're just like athletes. I gotta, I gotta change it up quite a bit or they get stale. Yeah. You know? Yes. So, yep. Very cool. Any closing words before we uh, shut it down, Mark? This was well, awesome. You know, it was great. I got a, I love to do part two. You yes. know, I tell people if I bore you with my stories, just tell me to shut up. But no, this was, I got, this was awesome. I got a few because it's, you know, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was great. Uh, next time we chat, would love to chat about your, uh, like I said earlier, you I see you like deadlifting at night at the end when you're done coaching everybody very hard, you know, when you're fatigued to do that. So uh, just that kind of commitment is you know, people are busy and you're finding a way to do it. So we'll definitely get into that. Um, so one more time, Philippi sports Institute.com yeah. and they could, can, what's the best way? How do you want them to you reach can out email to me you? right through the website? Yeah. Okay. Website. I'll link it, it up. It, I'm, I'm the, you know, social media and marketing. I'm not really, it's not one of my strong points. So that's my, you know, as you know, you're always saying I got older stuff out there, which is, is the truth. I got to, I got to do a better job at that. But um, yeah, you can just email me through the website, uh, Mark at Philippi Sports Institute. So great. Very cool. I'll link all that up in the show notes as well as on my blog. And uh, thank to everybody for listening. If you're listening, make sure you leave a five star review on Apple, share this with a friend, take a screenshot of it, post it on social, tag Mark. Uh, because I always say this is free for you guys, but not free for us. Um, it costs money to do these. And we, pre you know, I want to spread the word of this kind of knowledge. So Mark, hang tight um, as I shut it down. And again, thanks everybody. And uh, those five-star reviews are, are crucial. So thanks for everybody who take 30 seconds to do that. We'll talk to you the next time.